Did Pope Pius XII do enough to shield millions of Jews from the Nazis? We'll talk to a noted author and historian about that and even more tonight on EWTN Live. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Before I get to our guest, I want to point out this wreath that's behind me. Uh, The wreath was a gift for Father Thomas Dubay. As you recall, Father Dubay died just a couple weeks ago, and we, we miss him very much. And one of the viewers sent this beautiful wreath in his honor, and I thought, you know, we've been having it at the chapel, which has been nice, but I thought it'd be a very nice thing to be able to share with you tonight to remember Father DeBay and all the wonderful, wonderful TV shows he did, not only on EW10 Live, but mostly on his own uh, series. So God bless him and God grant him eternal rest. Now, our guest tonight is very interesting. She left home at the age of 13 to enter the convent of the religious teachers Filippini. And now, 75 years later, this fighting nun is trying to teach a powerful members of the circular media a thing or two about the truth regarding Pope Pius XII and his efforts to protect the Jewish people during the Holocaust. So please welcome our good friend, Sister Margarita Marchione. Sister Marchioni, how are you doing? Why don't you call me Sister Margarita? Well, would I'm, you rather me call you Sister Margarita? Yes. Well, then I'll call you Sister Margarita. Sister uh, Margarita, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I Good. love it here. Good. Good. I just, every time I think of Margarita, I think of a drink. Yeah. <laughs> and I just didn't want to go there. But that's okay. Uh, <laughs> No one ever said that to me. See? This is the first time. Is that right? Well, see, not everybody's a wise guy. (laughs) But one of the great things that you've been on here a number of times, and you've done a television series for us on Pius XII, and you've written 10 books about Pius XII. 20, because I translated them into Italian, too. So So you're going to do a two-for-one sale on these books. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Okay, then I'll go with that, because I have one of your Italian books, in fact. You could have all of them. Six, well, 61 is I, total. I've already read the English one, so I'll oh, just stick with that. ten. All right. But, you know, you've done tremendous work, because there's because been... Because a... I'm a nut. What do you mean you're a nut? Because nobody tells me to do this. I just do it because I want to do it. Because that I, doesn't make you a nut. That makes I, you diligent. I met him, Pius XII, in 1957. And I can still feel his presence. I was holding his hands, I remember that, in St. Peter's Basilica. And I chatted with him as though he were just a friend, you know, on a very friendly basis. And I told him what I was doing there. I was a young student from Columbia. And he was darling. I could never forget him. Never. Well, it was some years after that, about 1963, that a play called The Deputy was written. And that began this process of maligning him. Absolutely. And one of the things that you bring out in your books is that prior to The Deputy, the reputation of Pope Pius XII was wonderful. The whole world admired him. President Roosevelt, the Churchill, everyone throughout the world knew what he was doing to help save the Jews. He actually gave orders in Rome to all the convents and monasteries to open their doors and to take in 
any Jew that had to hide from the Nazis. This was in 1943, the year that the Nazis controlled Rome. And of course, they also controlled the Vatican for that matter. So the Pope had to be very, very careful. And he did hide Jews not only in the Vatican, but in all the convents. We had 60 in one convent. We had a total of 114 Jewish women hidden in three of our convents in Rome itself. And I spoke to some of the descendants of these Jews who were hidden right in the convent. And they remembered the stories that they were told. And some of the older folks actually remembered when they were children, they were being protected by the nuns. So the Holy Father did his share of saving Jews, believe me. Well, one of the big supporters of Pope Pius XII was Pincus Lapide. That's right. Now, Pincus Lapide was somebody who hunted down Nazis, but also did a lot of work to understand what happened to the Jews. He did a lot of the the, the very detailed work. Jewish historian. Very very important Jewish historian. That's right. Um, And as as a Jewish man himself, what did he say about Pope Pius XII? He did nothing but praise him. He knew what was being done. He knew that Pius XII gave orders to all the convents and monasteries to take in any Jewish man, woman, or child that needed to be protected. And he wrote about that. As a matter of fact, one of the things the Pope also did was have baptism records made up. Oh, yes, false. Yeah, false ones. False, yeah. but but so that they would be able to They're say protected. that they're Catholic. That's right, the Jews. <laughs> That's right, exactly. That's what he did. He did everything in his power to protect them, and he did save five thousand Jews. In five thousand? Five thousand, just in Rome. In Rome, right. In Rome, but throughout the world, only God knows how many were saved. I think I recall. Pincus Lapide saying... 860,000. 860,000, exactly. Correct. So that... And, and that... I remember Pincus Lapide is the one who said that Pius XII saved more Jews than, than everyone, Roosevelt, every, Churchill, else, together, or, or Stalin together. combined. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. And he was a saint, believe me. How, what do you mean by him being a saint? Uh, what, Just what, looking why would you at say him, that? He was very prayerful. He would be up till two in the morning in chapel praying. And I have a, a large uh, photograph of him two days before he died. Where was he? He was sick, but he was in chapel, and he's there with his hands folded like this, praying. Someone snapped his picture two days before he died. So he was really a very holy man. And I can vouch for that because I actually touched him. I actually held his hand. So, now, now, in terms of this holiness, um, when we call them, we call the Pope your holiness, but this was another quality of holiness, not just a title. It was something that he actually lived by, a very prayerful life himself. He did. He really did, you yeah. know. Well, he was very a saintly Pope. All I know is that he's in heaven, and when I go to Rome Saturday, I intend to see the Holy Father and ask him when he's going to beatify Pius XII. <laughs> I'd like to be there. Yeah. That's one, something I wish for, to be present for the beatification. And then the Lord can call me because it's time to go. Oh, well, I thought yeah. this was for me. <laughs> Hold your horses. You'll get flowers in your own time for now. These are Father Dubay's. <laughs> if I know Father Dubay, he'd be happy to share them. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would. But we're not going to do your funeral flowers yet. <laughs> now, one of the things about this attack on Pope Pius XII is that a lot of it has been perpetrated by the New York Times. You know, it's strange. When he was alive, they were so favorable. Who? The, the New York Times? New York Times, yes. They spoke very well of him. And then suddenly, everything changed. But you can't count on them, dear. We don't want to even be bothered with them. They, um, they called me I don't know, a feisty nun. Yeah? yeah. Were they wrong? 
<laughs> what part of that did they have wrong? They reported correctly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they really, you know, I don't like them too much. Well, <laughs> you know, one of the things that um, I, I've often said, because, you know, in the 1940s, during the war, mm -hmm. they were just praising him to the hilt. Absolutely. Absolutely. They call him the last voice of freedom in Europe. Mm -hmm. it was, the headlines in large, bold print were always very favorable, how he was saving the Jews. But then in the 1990s... Yeah, but when, you know, in the, well, 1960s, really, with the Ralph Hoshut, they began with the deputy. Yeah, the Hawk. That, yeah, Hawk, yes. And uh, then after that, but who cares what they say? We know the truth. Well, here's, here's one of the things, and this is why, you know, I disagree with you. I think we do care what they say because you've done all this work but they, and you make us care. And yeah, that's but, one of the great things care. about your work. They don't even know that I exist. Except for being feisty. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I like to say is if the New York Times does not agree with the New York Times, mm -hmm. then we don't have to agree with the New York Times either. That's right. And we can come up with the data. Now, one of the things that um, I was looking at some, some of the uh, elements of this book, and this is just one of them, because, again, I've got all your books, and uh, on Pius XII, that is. And You have ten books? Yeah. Oh, You've been here a lot of times. No. You keep leaving your books, so I read them. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things is, that he wrote, for instance, Sumi Pontificatus, oh, yes. and which he condemned that the Nazis. That was first. Sumi Pontificatus. Right. That was, that was uh, written yes. by uh, Pius XII, in which he ex implicitly condemned actions of the Third Reich. Absolutely. But am I wrong? I thought it was Pius XI. No, that you, well, what? you wrote here that it was Pius XII. <laughs> so I don't know which one is wrong. If you don't agree with yourself... <laughs> Then I won't agree with you either. But what year was that? Uh, you, you don't give the date, but right. you just that you, was in '36, I think. Well, so he was say, Secretary of State, but he wrote it for Pius the Twelfth, Pius the Eleventh. Well, uh, 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 I'm not sure the date that you gave, but you you, uh, you do well, mention anyway, that's, that it was Pius the Twelfth. Who and, do you think wrote the, most of the things that Pius the Eleventh signed? He was his secretary. Pius XII. Pius XII knew so many languages. He was able to handle everything. And he, as Secretary of State, really wrote that Sumi Pontificatus. And, and in this, he, he called this a real hour of darkness in which the spirit of violence and discord brings indescribable suffering on mankind. Sure. I mean, he was saying this stuff out loud. Because he knew the Nazis. He had been nuncio. He had been the nuncio there in, in Berlin. So he knew what the Germans were like at that time, the Nazis. But then, on the other hand, he also said to a group of the cardinals in 1943 mm -hmm. that, and I, I want to quote him precisely, that we have to be carefully weighed, all our public utterances have to be carefully weighed and measured by us in the interest of the victims themselves. You have to be careful. Why did he have to be so careful? Because the more he would speak... <coughs> excuse me, the more the Nazis would condemn and kill the uh, Catholics in Germany. So he had to be very careful. He wrote to the bishops there and explained to them why he wasn't publicly denouncing, because every time he did, more people were condemned to death, more Catholics. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what happened in Holland, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. 40,000. 40,000 were put to death because but, he spoke up, right. condemning them. And after that, he learned his lesson. So he didn't condemn publicly, privately. He did and did everything he could to save the Jews, sending them abroad, giving them money to travel, uh, hiding them in all the convents and monasteries and in the Vatican itself. So... What else could he have done? Right, right. No one did what he did. As a matter of fact, he used to have ships 
take yes. the Jews from Italy over to Turkey. Yes, and to uh, Portugal. Portugal? Yes. And uh, I have some stories that are very interesting uh, where he actually sent ships to um, Puerto Rico to all to this side of the, the world uh, by ship in order to let them get established elsewhere. Right, right. So he did his share. As a matter of fact, as I recall, one of the stories, there, there's a movie called Ship of Fools about a, a ship full of Jews mm -hmm. that was, uh, was, came to America and the Americans wouldn't let them land. And they were all children, 5,000 children. And the, the Cubans ship. wouldn't let them land either. No. Mr. Roosevelt and the president of Cuba were both afraid of what the Nazis might do. That's right, so they shipped them right back to Germany. So, the, so they were trying to escape, but, and Hitler used that for propaganda, saying, see, nobody wants the Jews, not even America. Yeah. And so th that was one of the propaganda. But, but on another ship, the Pope got the apostolic nuncio for Santo Domingo to That's let right. them get off the ship. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a story, I don't know which book it's in right now, but uh, this um, secretary of the nuncio in... Um, in Puerto Rico, uh, it tells the story of how he had orders from Rome to uh, protect these Jews who were coming, and they helped out. Look, the church did all it possibly could and did save thousands of Jews, so I think the Jewish people should be very grateful. Yeah. Well, one, one of the other things, too, that uh, you mentioned in your book is how Archbishop Sapieha in Poland, you know, told the Pope, don't say anything else yes. because it made it worse for the Polish people. Every time the Holy Father spoke, the Nazis became more embittered and indignant and condemned the Catholics. They were put in prison. They were, they were sent to, the, um, uh, to prison. That's where they were. And then they were killed, don't right. they? Now, one of the other things, too, that you mentioned in your books is that the, uh, uh, the Nazis hated the Catholic Church. Some I, I, I've heard one of the modern atheists say that, the, that Hitler was a Catholic. Oh, he was baptized like so many baptized uh, Catholics who don't live their religion. After his baptism, he wasn't Catholic anymore, believe me, because what he did in his life time certainly doesn't classify him as a Catholic. He didn't live as a Catholic, so you could forget about that. But see, this is one of the problems, because the atheists, uh, as a matter of fact, if anything, Hitler was himself an atheist. Oh, absolutely. He denied that he, he believed in God. So, he, the, but the atheists don't want him on their side. <laughs> well, nobody wants him. <laughs> well, the problem is the atheists got him. He was on their side, and he hated the Catholic Church. One, one of the things that he wanted to do was take Pope Pius XII and move him out of the Vatican, yes. make him a prisoner. Absolutely. And he had, they had all plans right. for him to be taken from and for the uh, Nazis to take control of the Vatican. Right. Yeah. But they, they didn't actually do it. I think they were a little bit of afraid of him. <laughs> but the... Um, and you, as you mentioned, the Nazis eventually took over control of Italy, but originally they were not. Originally, Mussolini was in charge of Italy. Oh, yes, but then Mussolini was on their side, so they took control. And what they did after 1943, as they were leaving Italy, as the Allies were coming in to Rome, and then the Nazis had to leave all the way up to northern Italy, they did nothing but massacre the Italians. And in some of the, I don't know where I have these stories, but maybe one of the books you'll find how they would go to these little villages, get all the people in the village into the church, and then bomb the whole church. So the whole village was destroyed. Yeah. They did so many terrible things, really. It's, it's how they could even think of doing these terrible things, I can't imagine. But uh, they did. And entire villages were just destroyed yeah. on their way out of Italy. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, this this was a, a really sad situation. And again, hardly the action of somebody who loved the, the church. They, they, they hated the church. They hated God. They hated the Jews. They hated the communists. They only loved themselves. And they hated whoever tried to save the Jews. Right. So naturally they hated the Catholics, yeah. 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 But this is, you know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, we carry your books at our religious catalog. You know, it's extremely important that we have this material available because when the modern atheists will make their accusations, you've got the data to show the opposite, that this is not the truth and that they have not done anything, uh, that the Pius XII did not harm the Jews and uh, it was just the opposite. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is this is uh, simply propaganda, and that's and that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind. You've got the footnotes. And that's one of the reasons I love your books. You've got the footnotes, so that if you want somebody wants to check out what you say, they can go and look it up and check it out for themselves. So that it's not just you saying that this is how you feel. You've got the evidence to show that this is what's going on. Well, I try to be as honest as possible. And to just write whatever I had documentation for. Right. There's nothing invented in any of these stories. Oh. Well, you've done f- fantastic work, and I'm hoping that your books help with the canonization process. Because it's not just that the Pope has got to declare this, but there also needs to be a sense that this really is somebody worthy of being a saint. And that the, the, the folks, all of us who are, are watching, we need to have a sense. This man deserves to be a blessed because he was a hero of the faith. Now, I'm going to go to Rome on Saturday. Okay. And sometime during the next three or four weeks, I intend to see the Holy Father. When I come home, I'd like to have a date for the beatification. So you just pray that I can get that date. And then everybody will be invited to come to Rome for the beatification. How's that? <laughs> now, now, it's a great thing for you to invite us all to Rome. Mm-hmm. Yes. Are you paying our tickets? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not because I, have, I don't have it. I don't own anything. Oh, sure. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, one, one, of the, one last thing I want to bring up, too. The Vatican has been making its secret documents. And we have secret archives. Yes. And they've been making these public. Oh, yes. Anybody can go and do research. But the press hasn't been doing it. Worse for them. They don't want to know the truth. Don't go. If you want to learn the truth, you have the opportunity to see the original documents. Yeah. That's, that's a, see, that's an important thing, that these secret archives are being made public. They are public. And so they're no longer secret. That's right. So we've got to call, stop calling them the secret archives and call them the public archives <laughs> to, to show that this material is available for anybody who wants to look at the, the, the firsthand information. Yes, and since they were opened, no one has gone there to do any research. How do you like that? I don't like it. I don't like it either. I didn't think you did. <laughs> Well, that's a good thing that uh, we agree on that. One of the things I also want to deal with, though, and we have just a few more minutes. Uh, You've written one more book. Here you are, 88 years old. Going on 89. But you're not there yet. But I'm almost there. Don't (laughs) jump the gun. She always wants to be older than she is. Look, you you can already get on the planes for free, you know. But at any rate, you've got a brand new book. And this is about... A hundred years of the Filipini sisters being it, in this country. That's right. 1910, 2010. That's 100 years. And I wrote the history of the 100 years. Well, see, one of the great things about you writing the history is you've been around for most of it. That's right. <laughs> 75. <laughs> You're right. 75 of the 100 I've been here. Yes. I mean, you're 75 years of Filipini sister. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so you, you're 75 out of the 100 years. That's right. There's not much you that goes past you. Oh, no. I knew all the founders. I knew everybody. Oh, that's cool. 
But now, tell us a little bit about St. Lucy Filippini, because not many people know about her. Oh, but she was <clears throat> a young girl who became a teacher, and really, among the nuns who were teaching orders, we go back to 1692. So I don't know which religious orders was founded, were founded before 1692, but all I know is that we are pretty ancient. <laughs> However, if you go to Montefiascone, which is uh, near Rome, about an hour away, you can go to the Basilica <clears throat> of Santa Margherita. Oh, yes. after whom you're named, I take it. <laughs> well, in that basilica, her body is intact. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they say her nails still grow. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there you are. Her body is intact. It's a lovely basilica. It goes back hundreds of years, and the crypt is all dedicated to her. It's, it's a nice... If you ever go to Rome and you want to go on a pilgrimage, well, let me know, and we'll have all the doors open for you. But her body is incorrupt. Oh, that's really uh, something else. Yes. And uh, a couple things. Um, it was some, many of the Filipini sisters themselves who hid Jews, to go back to our other topic. A lot of the Filipini sisters were hiding the Jews in their convents. Oh, we had three convents in Rome. And in these three large convents, they were schools, you know, and uh, they had plenty of room. We had 114 Jewish women hidden for almost a year, 1943, when the Nazis were in Rome. And I met with the descendants of some of these people. And I remember one elderly gentleman who said he was a little boy and he was living in the convent with his mother, just like so many other little children who were with their parents, hidden. But in the convents, of three of our convents, we had 114 Jewish women hidden. Now... The Filipini sisters mostly are teachers. Only teachers. Okay, that's all that you do is teach. Religious teachers. Filipini is the surname of St. Lucy who founded us. Right. So, so the, the, the name of your the, the, uh, the teaching order. And how are you doing with vocations? Poorly. Now, how many of you have nieces, or young daughters, or, or just the grandchildren, grandchildren that might want to become nuns. Will you please let them get in touch with me because we need nuns. And it comes from the family, believe me. You grandparents or parents, you have to encourage vocations. They'll be very happy. I mean, I've been happy all my life. Look, 75 years, I don't have one moment of regret that I can say, oh, I'm sorry I ever made this choice. I really don't. Yeah, yeah. I've been very happy. I've been... Uh, doing God's work. I taught many, many years. I taught on all levels. I was 20 years at Fairleigh Dickinson University. So it isn't that I've been just sitting around. I sat around all day today. (laughs) You needed a break. (laughs) But uh, actually, I mean, I'm, I'm the treasurer of our order, so I'm still very busy. Right, you're still working. Yes, of course. Yeah. And I intend to work to the very end. But we're trying to promote some vocations so that some, because someday you might not be here. That's right. And I want somebody to take my place. All right. So. Maybe about five or six. We need about maybe ten. ten. All right. Ten. <laughs> It'll take ten girls to replace you. And well, I believe no, it. No, I don't think so. No, no. I only need one to replace me. But I'd like to have a little extra around. For oh, the that's future. a good thing. Well, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm out of right now is extra is time. So we need Why? to take a break because this is the way the TV works. So I got to take a break, but we'll be back in two minutes. And we want to get your questions and your comments for sister. So please stay with us. Oh, I'll be here.
Thank you. Thank you, and welcome back. We're with Sister Margarita Marchioni, and we're talking about some of her work that she's done on a variety of topics, but especially Pope Pius XII. If you'd want to send an email, you can write to www.sistermargarita.com. Sistermargarita.com. And Margarita is spelled M-A-R-G-H-E-R-I-T-A. So it's not like the drink. I thought I had Gmail now. Do you? Well, it says .com. So I, that's all I can tell. Gmail.com. Gmail.com. Okay. Well, that, that's, oh, this is your website, not your email. Oh, I can't. Never I mind. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now we also have a couple of groups here today. We have one group from Illinois and another big one from Cincinnati, northern Kentucky. And it's great to have all of you guys here. Thank you so much for being here, plus individuals from other places. And we'd love to have you come and join us. If you can get a group together or if you want to come on your own or with your family or a parish group, please contact our pilgrimage department. Uh, you can call them at 205-271-2966, 205-271-2966, or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll help you with all kinds of information about where you can stay, places to go eat, and you know my favorites. Did you know that the, re the restaurants in this town of Irondale, Alabama, have religious themes? Did you know that? No. Yeah, that's true. We have hamburger heaven. <laughs> <laughs> the barbecue is golden rule barbecue. Oh, See, no. you got the golden rule there. So, so we've got lots of stuff going on here. And we'd love to have you come and join us as well as come to the masses here at the network and up at the convent and go on tour as well as be at the shows. So come on down and join us here on Pilgrimage. And don't forget this uh, coming weekend in Akron, Ohio. Go to our website to find out more information about the family weekend that we're going to have in Mother Angelica's hometown. Are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. All right, let's start off with Vincent who's calling in. Hello, Vincent. Uh, hello, Father. Where are you from? Uh, New York. Great. And what's your question? My question is, uh, does Sister feel that the Soviet communists were largely responsible for the disinformation about Pope Pius XII? All right. So do you think that the Soviet communists were largely dis, uh, uh, responsible for this disinformation about Pope Pius XII? Yes, because Pius XII did a lot to fight the communists in, in Italy. In fact, he was responsible for Italy not turning communists in, at the end of the war uh, because he instructed the Catholics how to vote against them. So I would say that they were uh, sort of afraid of him. They knew that he had a great deal of power as Pope. Okay. All right. Good. We have a question here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Huntsville, Alabama. Great. Good to have you here. And what, what is your uh, question? Well, Pius XII in Humanae Generis asked for equal treatment of creation versus evolution, paraphrasing. Did he speak out during World War II against Hitler, who was obviously an evolutionist and survival of the fittest par excellence, if you want? I wonder if he also spoke during World War II or in that era during the Nazi Holocaust. All right, so do you know if Pius XII spoke out against evolution during the Nazi era? Well, he spoke out against all the things that needed to be spoken about, and I'm pretty sure he certainly spoke about the evolution there. So yeah. I really I can't uh, uh, tell you precisely where you would find that, but in all his encyclicals, you certainly have enough information yeah, yeah. The, the humanity, humanity generous would be the one encyclical where he actually did address the issue mm -hmm. of evolution mm -hmm. and some of the church's teaching on it. But uh, I don't recall anything during the war. But I think the man brings up an important point. Adolf Hitler was very much taken by Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. and very much believed in survival of the fittest. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he saw himself doing was getting rid of the unfit. Oh, he began even before the war. Killing, exactly. Killing all those who were handicapped. Right. Yes. Yeah, they, would ex- they, they started off. I, rem- I met uh, two women in Germany. when I, I lived in Germany for a while, mm-hmm. uh, studying the language. And one woman worked in a, 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 a school for the mentally disabled. Mm-hmm. And she remembers the day that the Nazis came to the school. They put the children in the back of a truck mm-hmm. and took the exhaust from the truck, oh. put it into the, the back of the truck and gassed all the children oh. to death. And then after, because she saw that she was on their wanted list, mm-hmm. so she had to hide for the rest of the war. Mm-hmm. Oh, so, so many had to do that. But, that. but this was part of his ideology that mm-hmm. you have to get rid of the unfit. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he, he got did. that right out of uh, Charles Darwin's, especially the, his book, The Ascent of Man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yes. uh, do you want to uh, go to another caller? Let's call Dan. Hello, Dan. Hi, Father. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? Good, good. From Connecticut. Great. Um, what I'd like to ask is, have there been any public defense uh, arguments uh, presented by any Jewish groups or uh, prominent Jews or uh, even the, the state of Israel. I haven't heard uh, much as far as defense is concerned, and I was wondering if uh, Sister could comment on that. Thank you. All right. All right. So have we already mentioned Pincus Lapid, mm-hmm. and he was a Jewish, a That's very true. prominent Jew who defended Pope Pius XII. Are there others uh, in the Jewish community who have been defending Pope Pius XII. Well, right now there's an organization in uh, New York, Pave the Way. Yes. And uh, Gary Krupp is the head of that, and he's Jewish. And they uh, do speak very highly of Pius XII, so they, they do their share of uh, uh, protecting him, in a sense. Uh, there are other Jews in New York, for instance. I don't want to start mentioning names but are contrary. But really, we don't need them. We know the truth, and that's all we're interested in. One of the things to keep in mind, back, I think, in 1956, the Philharmonic Orchestra of the State of Israel came and played a concert. To show their gratitude for what he did in saving Jews during the war, the Philharmonic made a special trip to Rome to play for the Holy Father, Pius XII. And the one who organized that was Golda Meir, who later on became the prime minister That's of Israel. Right. Mm-hmm. And what about Einstein? He spoke very favorably of the church. So we have Jews during that period who recognized the good that the church was doing and acknowledged it publicly in the newspapers. There were many articles. And then you had those who just to this day don't acknowledge it. Yeah, yeah. You're planning to go to Israel yourself, aren't you? I'd like to, toward the end of the month, before I come back home. I I think I'm going to have to give a talk there. So I'll go there, I'll bring them my books, and see what I can do to convince them. Yeah, good but for there you. are some people, I know one historian, uh, Michael Tagliacozzo, who was in Rome when the Nazis came and had to hide from them, and he was saved. And he's a historian, he's elderly, but um, he's a very dear friend of mine, so I'll try to see him too. Oh, that's great, that's great. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Granite City, Illinois. Great, and what is your question? Well, um, I'm not quite understanding. Uh, We mentioned the New York Post had this... New York Times. No, New York Times, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with all the papers. Um, But where, where is the other criticism for the Pope coming from, and do you think this is kind of like, what is their agenda for, for doing so? Is it just to malign Pope Pius, or is it the whole Catholic the whole Church? Catholic or? Church. I would say the whole Catholic Church. I mean, mm-hmm. most of them don't know very much about Pope Pius, I'm sure, but they do know about the Catholic Church, and I would say that it's to condemn the Catholic Church. That's why we have to be able there to uh, 
uh, to be good Catholics, the way you have good Catholics here tonight. You're so lucky to have an audience like this. Oh, I know it. I'm blessed. This is a great audience. I mean, you don't have to worry about anybody coming here and shooting you (laughs) or me. (laughs) You maybe not. Me. We're in in good hands. (laughs) But... But there, there, I think there's some other things, too, that this man is bringing up in terms of some of the agenda. Somebody like Hochhut oh. was himself very much a socialist. Mm-hmm. And, and he was against the church because he, didn't, he saw the church as an obstacle to socialism. Mm-hmm. So that, was one of, that seems to be part of his agenda, according to some authors. Yes, that's true. And then you also had a number of Catholic authors in the 1990s or ex-Catholics. Well, yeah, like And, uh, and a lot Cornwell. of them, I think a lot of like, them were writing because yeah. they didn't like Pope John Paul II. Mm-hmm. And this was a way to be mean to the papacy as, That's as right. a whole. So they got back at Pius XII. Yes. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Well, today, some of them have retracted, like Cornwell. He retracted. Cornwell has re- retracted. He has retracted some of the things, not everything. But he said he, he realizes he, you know, exaggerated. For instance, he said that he went to the Vatican archives and was there weeks at a time. According to the record where they had to sign in, he was there two or three days. You know, exaggerations like that. Two or three days became three or four months. So you, you can't count on everything that he says. But see, here's the problem. Something like the New York Times does not report his exaggerations. Absolutely. When he exaggerates and admits it, they don't report that. Oh, no. But they do report his criticisms. Mm -hmm. And see, and that's one of the things that's totally unfair and unacceptable. Oh, when he was in this country, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, I guess, and um, I refuted him. He was by satellite and I was by telephone. But here he was talking to me, and I just told him in plain English what I thought of him. (laughs) Um, I don't know that we can be that plain on this network. (laughs) No, I'll be careful, dear. Good, thank you. There are kids out there. (laughs) All right, let's we have another caller. We have Christine on the line. Hello, Christine. Hi, Father. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Where are you from? I'm from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Great. And what is your question? Well, you sort of answered my um, question just now from uh, that gentleman in the audience. Um, I'd like to add a comment, though. I was in uh, Jerusalem in 1998, and and I went to the huge Holocaust Museum. Yad Vashem. And there is a a picture of the Pope stating how he did nothing to help save the Jews. And I, I was shocked and very, very hurt when I saw that. I don't know if it's still there. It's still there. But in 1998, it wasn't. Again, I was just wondering why, when we all know how, how holy this pope was and how he saved thousands of Jews, the only world leader to do so, is, is he so um, held with such contempt? It's still there, but I intend to get that taken down when I go. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. Are you going to tell them in plain English? Oh, of course. I'll give you a few plain Hebrew phrases to go along with it. <laughs> okay. Send it to me. <laughs> All right, we have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? From northern Kentucky. Great. Good to have you here. What's your question? My question is about the vocation sister was talking about. Uh, you said there were uh, three uh, uh, places in Rome. Where are the places in the United States? So where, where are your convents? And you want oh. us vocation? You, you got to tell us Absolutely. where you are. <laughs> oh, there you, you go. Thank you. Great views. That's suggestion. wonderful. Well, we a mother house. We can show them a picture of the mother house. Is in Morristown, New Jersey. That's where I reside, and I'm treasurer there. So uh, I'll take good care of your granddaughters. <laughs> That is the only uh, place you have in the United States? No, we have about 30 or 40 co- different convents, but mostly in New Jersey and uh, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island. And as far down, where are we now? We're in, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, where am you I? You are in Alabama. Alabama, that's right. 
Well, we don't have any as far south as Alabama. <clears throat> but um, look, you send them over, and we'll take good care of your girls. Don't worry. I think I've got a photograph of your convent here. I that's, don't know if they can that's show the that. Mother or not. House. They might not be able to get it up close, but it's a great big convent and with you know, lots of room. You know where I work? My you work office? Over, yeah, over all down the way here. The, no, all the way down, the last number there. You see that all the way down? In they got the, you as far away from the center <laughs> as they could. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you must be trouble. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of it. We have another call. We have Lorraine on the line. Hello, Lorraine. Hi, Father. Hi, where are you from? Tampa, Florida. Great. Good to have you on the line. What, what's I'm your really question? I'm really enjoying the show. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to ask Sister Margarita, are there any miracles attributed to Pope Pius XII? And uh, if so, does she, can she tell us about them? Oh, thank I'd you. be delighted to tell you about this. Uh, I got word. A young teacher in um, Santa Marinella, that's about an hour away from Rome, had a terrible illness she was dying, and during the night, her husband had a dream, and he dreamt of Father Pio, and Father Pio told him not to pray to him, but to pray to Pope Pius XII. She was cured. I had the miracle in my last book. Is that right? Yes. I don't know where now. I'd have to look for it, but it, 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 this is a, a, hopefully that would be one of the miracles for his uh, beatification. So you pray to Pius XII, please, and just tell him that we need another miracle. And uh, hopefully we'll have him beatified, because if you want to come on that trip, we can't wait too long, because I'm going to be 89 years old. <laughs> Next year. Yes, February. It's, Next February, yeah. It's yeah, around yeah. the corner. Yeah, it was, but so. you are 88 now. Just remember that, young lady. But you have to count from conception. <laughs> so I'm really 89. <laughs> Isn't that right? I swear. You've been insisting on this all day long. Well, now, it's, it's the truth. One, one, one of the things, though, about, uh, you know, Pope Pius, with that, with that one miracle, I think that's one of the reasons why the Vatican is so interested in pushing the cause, because... They've received a favor from heaven, mm -hmm. you know, indicating that this man's piety and holiness is something that the church needs to recognize. And so with that miracle available, they, they want to go ahead with this process. But the politics and the, the public pressure has been great. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted you on this show is to let our people know to put counter pressure back. Absolutely. And that, that you pray. Put, they should pray. Get a miracle report the miracle, and then come to Rome for the beatification. <laughs> All right? That sounds good to me. Now, for 13 years, the, 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 the war ended in 1945, mm -hmm. and Pope Pius lived to 1958, another 13 years after the war. Right. Did he have to deal with any criticism during his lifetime? Did they start this criticism during his life? No, not that I know. As I recall... He was recognized as a good pope, a holy pope, and acknowledged for saving 5,000 Jews in Rome. How? Because he gave orders to the convents and monasteries to open their doors and to hide these Jews. And that's what they did. And that's how 5,000 Jews were saved. In fact, the chief rabbi of Rome, yes, Zola. Stayed, Z Z Zola, stayed in the Vatican itself. Yes. He was hidden in the, in the Pope's mm -hmm. own residence. And he wrote a book on his life, and he acknowledged what the church did during that terrible year of the occupation by the Nazis. So we have a firsthand information from the rabbi, the chief rabbi, who himself became a Catholic, and then his wife and his daughter were also baptized and he took the name Eugenio. In honor of Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli. That was, that was his name before he was known as Pius XII. He was Eugenio Pacelli. That's right. And the, when the chief rabbi of Rome became a Catholic, he took, he took the name Eugenio in honor of the Pope. That's right. Mm -hmm. And there's not much higher honor than that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, after the war, 
the Nazis were done mm. and, the, and the fascists were done. Mm. But the Pope had to spend a lot of his time dealing with the communists because the communists took over where the Nazis left off. Mm -hmm. Tell, do you have any data about that, any information about his relationship with the communists? Well, I have relationship with them. How so? <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> I, I went to see the head of the communist, Togliatti. I went to see this years ago. And why did I go see him? I was doing some other work on uh, a poet. And there was some connection there. Oh, his mother was in love with the poet I was writing about, and that's what, that was the connection. But when I went to the communist headquarters and the guards saw me, dressed as a nun, of course, and I'm asking to go see their leader, Togliatti, they almost died. <laughs> they couldn't believe their ears that I wanted to go see him. But I went up and he was very gracious with me. And then he wrote his book and he even talks about this uh, meeting that we had. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I don't even remember the name of the book, but I know I could find it if I want to. <laughs> but anyway, that was my connection with them. I went to their headquarters. But Pope Pius XII, as we mentioned, not only was opposing the communists in Italy, but he was dealing with world communism because the, the communists took over Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and there were so many Catholics who were being uh, oppressed. 200,000 priests were killed by the communists, yes. and that's just priests. It doesn't mean... That's, that's not to and, mention the and, millions of lay people who were killed by the communists as well. And how many priests were killed by Hitler? Only God knows. Right. Yeah. But actually, he didn't kill nearly as many people as the communists did. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that people forget, that the communists killed way more than the Nazis did. Mm -hmm. They were far more cruel. I, I think uh, in 1992, the KGB came up with a figure, 62 million people oh. of their own citizens that they executed or starved to death mm -hmm. or, or uh, worked to death. So, yeah. and, you know, so it's, it's huge compared to what the Nazis did. But Somehow, because they were our allies, we, we forget about you mm -hmm. know some of that some of that mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. But the, the the horrors of communism uh, are something that we should never forget either. And but Pius the twelfth didn't forget. He was against communists. He fought them yeah. the best he could. So, but the um, but that's also one of the reasons to go back to some of our questions because he was so strongly against world communism and spoke up as a strong voice, as, as, just as strongly. In one sense, it was easier for him to be stronger against the communists because they weren't, you know, surrounding him in Italy. You know that Pius XII was in this country for one week? Yes, I 1936. do. 1936. Yes, I he do He came know here, that. he was Cardinal Pacelli at the time, and he made a tour of the United States in one week and um, stopped off at Fordham where they gave him an honorary degree. And when he's talking to the students during this uh, reunion, he says to them, I give you, how does it go now? No, I, don't, no, I can't remember the story exactly, but he wanted to give them a day off Instead, it sounded like three days off. And, of course, the students just applauded. Instead, <laughs> they misunderstood him. They were giving him one day off, and they wanted the three days off after they thought they heard him say three. Oh, well. That's well, it. So that wrong. was his As a matter of fact, we have a nice crowd here from Cincinnati, and there's a high school named after him. I think he went to Cincinnati. And, they, and Cardinal Pacelli High School is mm -hmm. still named after him. Yeah. Well, you know what's happened, don't you? What? We've run out of time. Oh, no. That's we, true. We just about began. I know, but, it, but you know, at, at your age, time goes by quickly. <laughs> <laughs> How true. You're at right. my age, too. At my age, too. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for being with us and for bringing us this wisdom. And I want to bless all of you. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. 
may he lead you in all of his ways by his truth and by his love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And remember, we can bring your sister Marchioni and the series that she's done and all the other good things that she's been able to do only because this network is brought to you by you. If you don't give your support, we can't do the things that we do on this network. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. And keep on bringing more programs to you tonight and every other night. God bless you and thank you so much.